So we've talked about Elaprib and what the new Elaprib Solo 2, which mm -hmm. we don't really know. We've talked about Recaprib, which is going to be probably the next approval. And now Neraprib, this mammoth phase three trial, 22 months versus five months, you know, whatever, 0.27 hazard ratio. So, so Tom, we're going to have some familiarity with the lap rib, although it's going to be probably even a new and better lap rib. Right. When you go to choose which PARP inhibitor to use, how much does familiarity drive it, or is it efficacy, and you're going to do cross crowd comparisons, is it cost? How Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Next question. <laughs> uh, all those things are going to get considered. Um, certainly, you know, you're going to look at the different and, and varied uh, toxicity profiles that you see with these. You see a little more thrombocytopenia with neraprib. Okay. Um, I believe it's like 34%, mm -hmm. grade 3, 4. Maybe a few LFT elevations with right. the caprid, maybe that's not important. Right, uh, exactly. And a little more, at least from what we saw earlier, maybe a little more GI perhaps uh -huh. with the but we won't know, and that may one? change, uh -huh. and, and we'll have to look at that data carefully. So I think that that'll be part of the, the puzzle. One of the pieces that you'll look at is toxicity profile. You're going to look at um, indication and what's going to be covered based on, and, and now these are all catching up to one another as these right. trials report and as the labels expand and change. It's a dynamic process. And I honestly think uh, cost uh, could certainly play a role. So Katie, am I looking for something that doesn't exist? Are these drugs really more similar than different? In other words, am I looking for a difference when one doesn't really exist and more practical things like cost and contracting, what do you think? Uh, I think, again, it's, it's too early to know if one is better than the other. Certainly, they have differences in the, in the Petri dish in terms of potency, but um, even the three we're talking about are all really pretty potent PARP inhibitors, and they're all, they all work in the studies that they have been tested in. You know, they all work. So until they're compared head-to-head, -head, which they may never be, we're not, I don't think we're going to say this is the better part than this one. So the market, I think, is going to drive, is going to drive selection. And the toxicity differences are potentially, you know, I think you have this wonderful neuriparib data, which is pretty, has the potential to be paradigm shifting. Right. But I'll tell you what I'm doing in my practice, because I'm waiting for that drug, is I'm switching all my patients who are on platinum right now to cisplatin, so I don't use up all their and platelets. Mm -hmm. Oh, but you can just dose reduce in a wrapper. I mean, it's... But it's, I don't, maybe I don't want to. So, but, so, but so, even but in patients who dose reduction... We, so I know that, but I don't want to bring them down to 100. Is, so, the, is, so, the, is the reason that there's more thrombocytopenia with neraprib because there's a higher dose, or is it because the agent is different? Well, I, I mean, think it, we don't know. It could be higher dose. It could be some off-target effects. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are, there are some differences between these drugs and how they bind to the different PARP inhibitors, okay. and there's actually some other targets that they can bind to as well. But well, um, and there's bioavailability differences, uh -huh. yeah. too, right. and that could be affected. But having things. been, you know, we have the NOVA trial open. Um, we have the quadra trial open right now, and my comfort level with the drug in, um, is you have to be very wary of the thrombocytopenia. And what does that mean, worry? As soon as those playlists start to go down. So uh, what you're saying is weekly I, CBCs in the first cycle. Well, I can't remember the exact. Yes. Um, I feel comfortable with that, yeah. but I can't so, remember the exact. I think it's like day 15. It is. is really day 15, day cycle drop. one is right. when you see and, the majority. And when I see and them start to really drop, I just do a dose reduction. I haven't right. gotten into any problems. Now, okay. the first few patients I had on trial, I got into more issues with thrombocytopenia because I wasn't as comfortable dose modifying quickly. But I don't think but, decreasing yeah. the dose affected efficacy. Right. So I think that a um, couple things here. The, the, in the elaborative experience, we learned long ago that, that there's probably a threshold for where dose is important, but there's a large therapeutic range. We did the 200 versus 400, and if you look at the PFS in that study, it really is about the same. So, you know, so I think we have the leeway, but I think the key to, to using this in the clinic, outside of a clinical trial, is just be wary or not to be mindful of all of these particular things, like even the LFT elevation, which right. we did see in, Air, in Ariel 2, that, that we need to monitor these things. You can't just give it and forget it. You know, we have to, we, and, and that frequent modification was a common 
uh, element of all of the trials. But dose, continu dose discontinuation was low. Right, that's what I'm saying. So, so dose we, interruption, dose delay high. So, so to get to Tom's yeah. point at the very beginning, you asked mm -hmm. him like, what is it about familiarity? And you know, in the in the yeah. we've asked that question to large audiences, and dose and familiarity is a big deal. It is. And so, mm -hmm. when you have a large database and a familiarity of administering the drug, there is comfort with that. Right. And so the numbers are good. It says if we if they can if they say that all this is a push on numbers from the efficacy standpoint, it's going to be those That's types of things are going to drive. So let's talk. About